It is now five past six, and we are going to make an official start. My name is Andreas Bieler. I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for the Study of Social and Global Justice, together with my two colleagues, Oliver Dodd and Tony Burns, who are also present here. And it's my pleasure to be this evening's chair, introducing our speaker, Michael Roberts, as well as conducting us through the question and answer session. Before I do so, however, I'd also would like to say a couple of words about CSSGJ, that's the acronym for the Center for the Study of Social and Global Justice. We used to be affiliated to the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham, but over the years, while the financial contributions to centers declined ever more, uh, the monitoring procedures of what centers are doing, what they should do, and the direct impact on what our program should look like became ever more intensive. And so it's really that about one year and a half ago, we decided to become a fully independent research center, open for free debate on the center left and the left. And in order to... to uh, develop this, we have now also uh, implemented a membership option, and I'm going to put in the chat the relevant link. Perhaps it's of interest for one or the other, Yeah, if you would like to become part of the center. There is a small fee. It's £25 annually for unwaged or colleagues from the Global South. It's £10 per year. That really man that money really helps us to keep the show on the road, for example, to pay for Zoom subscription, to pay for our internet uh, uh, software. In exchange, of course, that also allows those who are becoming a member, that allows uh, you to co-shape the future of the sender and to co-decide what kind of events we should be putting up. So have a look. Perhaps it's of interest to one or the other uh, membership is now open to CSSGJ. Okay, however, let's come to our uh, uh, guest this evening. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Michael Roberts to you. It's a very interesting career. Yeah, as you mentioned just before the talk, you've worked for many decades in the city of London. That's clearly where we all also the economic expertise uh, uh, comes from. But since then, you've actually been much become much more well known. First of all, through your blog, the next recession, and I'm going to put uh, a link to the blog into the chat in a moment. But also, and that's how you came to our attention. You've just recently co-published a book with Guillermo Carcheri. Capitalism in the 21st century through the prison of value. We've read it in the local reading group. Colleagues are really excited to hear you speaking about it. It's I'm not going to say anything about the contents, but it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic read. So very much looking forward to your presentation here. We conduct the seminar in the usual manner. You will have between 35 and 40 minutes for your presentation. And then I'm going to open up for another 35, 40 minutes for questions, answers, and debate. While we listen to Michael, please make sure you've all got your microphones muted. And then of course, once we get to the Q&A, uh, microphones can be switched on. Michael, very warmly welcome to CSSGJ. Over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Andreas, and uh, thank you, CSSGJ, for inviting me to uh, present to your group, um, particularly about this uh, new book that uh, Guglielmo Karkedi and myself have uh, written and published uh, towards the end of last year, early part of this year, uh, by Pluto Books. So um, the reason, uh, just to say a brief word about uh, Karkedi, uh, an Italian Marxist economist who's uh, even older than me. <laughs> and he's uh, published a lot of uh, material over the last uh, decades on, on Marxist theory and also on empirical work. 
and we became into close collaboration over the last 10 or 15 years and now do joint projects together or we we'll still do separate ones as well and uh, i think uh, if you do read the book at some point uh, you may be able to uh, discern the differences in style uh, which obviously try to ensure that the book doesn't have too many differences in style but um, i have to say that um, uh, Gilgamo is, or Mino, as we say, which is uh, in Italian like Bill. Um, uh, Mino is uh, really a, an erudite expert on some of the theory, particularly the theory of knowledge and the chapter of knowledge, which I'll be briefly discussing. Um, we have to lay uh, at his door, for better or worse, as a contribution in the book in particular, but also other, obviously other parts. But let me uh, just go through uh, the basis of the book. And to do that, I'm going to... Uh, uh, share a few um, slides with you, if I can get that to work right. Um, so here it is, Capitalism in the 21st Century Through the Prison of Value. So the book is being a little ambitious. It's trying to look at all the major uh, trends and changes taking place in capitalism now that we're into the third decade of this century, uh, but also not just looking at it in a sort of descriptive manner, but trying to analyze it from the basic uh, Marx economic uh, category, in particular, uh, Marx's law of value, which um, is key, we think, to understanding why capitalism takes the direction it does on so many of the different issues that the book uh, deals with. Um, so the themes of the book are really along these lines and there's chapters on each. First of all, what is value, which I'll spend a little bit of time on because I think that's important for us to uh, grasp what uh, Marx and what uh, a really clear understanding of uh, economic change in society under capitalism requires a theory of value. Then we'll look at how that applies to nature and the environment, which is literally a burning issue at the moment, as we're all aware with climate change, pandemics and the environmental destruction that's going on. And then in the next chapter to look at money, which is uh, how it represents value, and also some look at the modern uh, developments that have taken place in monetary theory in the last few decades uh, as a result of what's happened in capitalism and, and how that's produced different theories now that have uh, tried to uh, do, do use money or develop money as a key factor in capitalist development. And most topically of all, uh, there is in the book some brief discussion uh, of the nature of inflation, how it emerges, and uh, what uh, causes inflation in modern capitalism. Then a key chapter for me, anyway, is uh, why capitalism has regular and recurring crises, which it does. And we're looking at the question of capitalist uh, mode of production, the creation of value and surplus value, which leads to uh, a crisis between the growth of capitalism in the sense of uh, increasing the productivity of labor and raising the level of living standards and uh, the, the need for capitalists to obtain a sufficient profit in order to do that. And those two things come into conflict as a key uh, contradiction in capitalism, which leads to crises and also the failure to deliver at the end of the day uh, for the majority of the 8 billion people that we now have as humans in the world. Then an cha important chapter on imperialism, which has often been neglected in recent uh, decades, the nature of imperialism, does it still exist? What is it? Uh, what form does it take now in the 21st century? And to look also specifically at countries uh, in the uh, world and decide whether they can be described as imperialist or not. Uh, and what are, what are the categories in, uh, in order to make us define that and understand that better? And then as I mentioned before, uh, a chapter on what has been come the most, one of perhaps the most important development in uh, capitalist sectors now, uh, namely the development of knowledge production, the development of robots to replace uh, human labor, and also development of knowledge production, where mental labor is now becoming just as important as, uh, as objective labor, and just as material to the creation of value and surplus value. Knowledge is becoming commodified, we have robots replacing labor. We have the development of artificial intelligence. How is that going to infect, affect humanity over the next few decades? And finally, as uh, socialists, of course, we must look at what we mean by socialism. And our chapter there attempts to deal with 
what's the difference between socialism and capitalism? What's the nature of uh, socialism? And perhaps draw out some understanding of how the process between uh, capitalism, a capitalist mode of production, would move towards uh, socialism. So a very lot is in the book. And as a result, well, it's not always deal with everything thoroughly, but we think it does add some to our understanding of what's going on. But let me start with uh, uh, the theory of value, which I think is very important for us to follow. Now, human beings have always labored to make things uh, using tools uh, to get things they need for food, clothing and shelter in order to survive. In, in hunter-gatherer societies, production was organized for uh, on a almost on a daily basis, everybody would go out together in order to try and raise enough food and other uh, things to protect humanity and to consume that fairly quickly. Uh, there was no process of uh, production for exchange or uh, for um, uh, to make money. This did not exist in hunter gatherer societies on the whole. It was merely a very uh, simple process, uh, which Marx and Engels once called primitive communism, if you want. Primitive being simply the word that it was the very first stages of where people cooperate together to, to produce things to meet to consumption directly. In class societies like feudal societies, peasants become primary producers. They harvest the crops for everybody. And for the Lord in particular, he doesn't do anything. He gets that crops as a surplus product for the Lord to consume himself or to use as he sees. So we have a a different sort of uh, development of production, where for the first time in very clearly, we have a surplus product, which is appropriated by a small group who are the own appropriations of that surplus are therefore the ruling class, the controllers of the surplus themselves. But in a capitalist system, goods are not made for personal consumption of the workers or the bosses of a particular business. They're made for the purpose of exchange. That's the, the whole process becomes one in which for production is for sale on the market, and that's the purpose uh, of capitalism, not necessarily to make something that you yourself would consume. Workers at Apple don't cons go home with fistfuls of iPhones, and Steve Jobs didn't uh, live in a castle of iPads. Uh, what iPads have produced is to make money in the process of sale on the market, and uh, then workers get from that uh, their wages in making iPhones, and Steve Jobs and others who have the ownership of the means of production and control and own the commodities that are produced, gain a surplus by selling on the market. So in that sense, capitalism for the first time is a system for the production of more money for exchange and not for direct consumption. So Marx makes the point that we should therefore look at uh, what is something is worth. And when we look at something is worth, we have two aspects to it under capitalism. An item's use value is how it's used. So the use value of bread, for example, provides nourishment. The use value for a chair that I'm sitting on is, uh, is because you can sit on it. But regardless of whether the item is sold on the market or not, uh, that has a use value and it's useful to somebody. All societies produce use values, obviously, regardless of whether those items are sold on the market. But Marx makes the point under capitalism, we get a dual role in the value of something. It's not just its use. It's also the exchange value. It's a value that you get on the exchange on the market. The quantity in which one commodity exchanges for another commodity. Whereas use values are basically subjective to you uh, and me, and that could be different. So whether we think a glass of water is worth a lot to us as opposed to somebody else drinking a glass of water, there's a qualitative difference. Uh, whether something's a chair or a loaf of bread is also different. Uh, it, they have different use values. But how can we measure those uh, as having a general, if you like, abstract measure of how much they're worth in society? Under capitalism, the exchange value is measured purely quantitatively, like how many loaves of bread make up the monetary equivalent of, say, a chair. So the capitalist does not care what the nice, an item's use is, as long as it can make him money. So use values are only, only matter to capitalists insofar as they know they must produce something that somebody wants. Uh, but what they want is the exchange value that comes out of that. And that brings the basic contradiction in the Marxist law of value between use and exchange, between what people need and what capitalists want to make in terms of uh, selling it for money and hopefully for a profit from them. 
So how do we compare a block of cheese with a bite and uh, in that environment? Well, we must have a common denominator. Com commodities exchange according to the relative amount of labor time that it takes to produce them. That's what Marx is saying as his explanation and, uh, of a theory of value. This is the core concept behind Marx's theory of value. It is based on the relative amount of average amount of labor time that it takes to produce commodities. So that a uh, commodity can be measured really by the amount of labor time on average devoted to its production. So if it takes 10 times as long to make a chair as it does a loaf of bread, that would make a chair about 10 times more valuable. Or if you want another example, uh, a Tesla might cost you 50,000 pounds to buy and a pen will cost you 50 pence. Clearly, there must be a reason for the difference in those two prices. And basically what the law of value says is that the main reason for the difference is the amount on average of the labor time going into producing all the components, means of production, raw materials, and the employment of labor around the world to produce that Tesla, as opposed to how long it takes to produce one small big pen. So, uh, a toaster oven's price isn't determined by its concrete nature, uh, whether it's made using welding, electronics, mechanics, and assembly. It's measured by only by the number of general abstract hours that it's added up to. So that's the labor theory of value. There are alternative theories of value presented in mainstream economics. We can discuss those if you want. But the gist, the main alternative theory is what is called the utility theory. It says that the price of a commodity is determined by how much you want it. Uh, how, in, in, so, but if you think about that, everybody has a different degree of want uh, for a commodity, whether it's a Tesla car or a pen, and and that also that could vary uh, from day to day. So it's not a very good way of measuring uh, the value of anything in a modern uh, economy. Uh, and when you when you think of it that way, then clearly you need some common denominator which everybody can see will be relevant to uh, explaining. The value of a commodity. So, I mean, I, if you go into economic textbooks now uh, in uh, undergraduate courses, we're told that uh, price in a, of a commodity is determined by the supply and demand for it, which of course tells you absolutely nothing because why is why is the price of a Tesla at fifty thousand pounds and the price of a Bic at fifty pence? Well, because supply and demand equals fifty pence for a Bic and uh, fifty thousand for a Tesla car. Again, really doesn't tell you anything. You will need to go beyond just whether supply equals demand in order to understand what determines that price. And the labor theory of value provides the only objective way of, ex of explaining that. But, uh, but capitalism isn't just uh, a, one where it's producing a goods for sale on the market. It is only doing that because the owners of the means of production and uh, the controllers of the labor force uh, the capitalists, in other words, will only produce things that people need and to sell on the market if they can make a profit. And so the basis of capitalism is to uh, produce a certain amount of value which is appropriated by the capitalists after the workers have paid their fair day's wage for a day at fair day's work. Whereas peasants produced a surplus for the Lord to consume, now under capitalism, workers produce a surplus in a certain period of time for the capitalists to appropriate for themselves, but that surplus is only created through the process of sale on the market. You can't see that surplus except in the terms of the money. In other words, the difference between the amount of products or commodities sold by the capitalists and how much they pay workers in their wages. So you get the difference between on a working day, for example, between the necessary value that goes towards workers' wages and the surplus value that ends up being appropriated by the capitalists in the value of the commodity. So that's basically the theory of value. And it shows you a certain contradiction which exists between uh, production for need, for social need, and production for profit, and for the appropriation of that profit by capitalism. And it is a contradiction. It's a contradiction between the uses, values that we need, and the exchange values that the capitalist is looking for. And it comes into contradiction in many different ways. And in the 21st century, the clearest one we can see to begin with, the most serious one in many ways, is that uh, now a nature itself is under threat by the drive of capitalism to make more profit by expanding uh, production, capital into all parts of the globe 
to boost uh, profitability by extracting natural resources and producing also, we have now know, we now find out, a tremendous expansion and investment into fossil fuels and other dangerous uh, means of production, where it's completely uncontrolled uh, by uh, the capitalist process of production, which is leading to climate change, global warming, climate change and environmental destruction. And of course, and when we, look, we know the latest figures sh show continually that since uh, the uh, really for the last um, 100 years, we've seen a, a sharp rise in the average global temperatures around the world as production using fossil fuels in primarily and other means uh, leading to a sharp rise in uh, global temperatures because fossil fuels create uh, uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide uh, emissions, which heat up the atmosphere, as well as other gases like methane and so on as a result of industrialization and uncontrolled capitalist production. And we now though we're heading towards in this 21st century, which is in the first chapter is to say that to a tipping points where this irreversible damage is being caused uh, to the planet, to species, and eventually probably uh, to the lives of human beings if they're forced to move from incredibly hot areas or extreme weather conditions on a regular basis. And that's increasingly the case. And the environmental disaster isn't just in the climate uh, rise, but also in the use, the endangering of all our species. Many millions of species are grow slowly being wiped out over an increasing, at a decreasing rate uh, over the last 10, 50 years, both on the food and land and ocean and uh, through the various other methods that, of extraction and mining, leading to the destruction of uh, diversity of nature, both from flora and fauna. All these things are uncontrolled. And this is a result of a conflict between capitalism's desire for more profit and rather than production for meeting the needs, not only of humanity, but also to protect uh, nature. And the pandemic perhaps is a, one of the best examples of uh, that such a disaster. We There we have, a huge um, influx of various viruses, which have been uh, not been uh, close to humanity over the last 40 or 50 years. But as the expansion has gone into remote parts of the world through mining, timber, fossil fuel exploration, industrialization in general, industrial farming, what has happened is a lot of uh, humanity has come into contact with pathogens in remote parts of the world, which have been lying uh, only in, in inside very small numbers of uh, species. And that's now become across into uh, farm animals, into industrial areas and into humanity in the food markets and so on. And COVID-19 was one of those examples. There were some before, but the COVID-19 was first one we would say where there's been a massive uh, ex uh, spread of this virus across the world in, in away from an epidemic into a pandemic. And completely unprepared for this was capitalism for two reasons. First of all, they had spent no money whatsoever on the research in this area or introducing vaccinations and other protections for humanity if they come into contact with the these viruses, although they've been warned by um, many uh, authorities, including the World Health Organization, that there was a serious risk of such pandemics through virus uh, expansion across the world, but they had done nothing. And health systems, of course, were totally inadequately uh, invested in in order to prepare people. So we've lost something like 12 million people uh, who have died prematurely as a result of uh, the pandemic. pandemic. And uh, also a hard, large number of people have had such a severe reduction in their living standards as a result, not only of the lockdowns, but of deaths, of the long COVID and so on. And it's not over. As I say on the right-hand side of this uh, chart, you can see the comments being made uh, recently by the people who really matter uh, understanding this, saying that the suggestion is that uh, the pandemic should be needs to be given more importance because it's not over. There's every possibility of a further, further damage, damage to, to uh, uh, humanity and the planet as a result of other viruses. Uh, appearing. Disease X, it's called, could kill 50 million people in the next pandemic uh, if we if it comes along, according to Kate Bingham, who chairs the vaccine task force in the UK. 
uh, COVID, we were lucky, COVID was not that deadly. It was only killing uh, approximately between 0.1% and 0.5% of people who caught it uh, as a result. That still meant 20 excess deaths in 20 million excess deaths in the world. So just imagine if we have a higher level of uh, killing power from the virus, but also uh, a high level of spread of that across the world. And that's the risk that we lie ahead, which has not been resolved by capitalism or by even by the, the development of vaccinations to deal with COVID-19 recently. In chapter two, we deal go back to the question of uh, the relationship between money and value. Uh, Marx, Marxist economics argues that money is the expression of value. It's not a different sort of value. It merely expresses the value that we just dis discussed in terms of the average uh, necessary labor time involved uh, to produce various commodities. So money should really represent that value as it goes. But what's happened, of course, in uh, modern capitalist societies is that uh, money no longer directly expresses the amount of value that is being produced in a, an economy. It can vary, particularly now that we have what is called fiat money, where governments and central banks print money, uh, and they don't print it necessarily in line with the demand for money in relation to the expansion of an economy, but they print it in order for other reasons, perhaps in order to spend uh, over and above what actually is available to be produce. Now, in the ch this chapter, we don't go too much into that. We wanted to look at two aspects in particular that we felt um, were relevant in the 21st century. First, modern monetary theory uh, and cryptocurrencies. Um, as I say, Marx says that money necessarily crystallizes out of the process of exchange. It's a universal equivalent uh, in order to provide uh, an easy process by which we can uh, exchange bread, say, for a chair. We do that through a money which everybody accepts as uh, an, an acceptable equivalent to whatever amount of production of bread there is relative to an amount of a chair, whether it's dollars, pounds or gold, for that matter, in the past. But that means money can also be hoarded because you can uh, sell something, get the money, and you can hold it. You don't necessarily have to buy anything. So that raises the possibility of a breakdown between the process of exchange. But modern monetary theory, as opposed to Marxist monetary theory, which is a theory that's been developed particularly in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, 30 years really, um, says, argues that uh, money gives us the opportunity to overcome all the obstacles to the development of living standards in the world. Governments should just print as much money as they need. Don't borrow from uh, uh, banks and other institutions uh, to, in order to get extra money. Just print the money and then the governments can spend it on producing projects and things that will achieve full employment and take to the production of, of an economy forward. Now, in my view and the view that we express in the book, that is a, a naive way of looking at things because uh, it depends on what governments spend the money on and what those what if they're going to just hand it over to other to capitalist companies in order to produce things that they need, uh, then there's no guarantee that the, the extra production that will meet people's needs will appear because capitalism only invests as a profitability. It's one thing to have uh, funds available. It's another thing if whether capitalists will actually invest in productive investment to solve the problem. If profitability is too low, they will not do that. So the, the risk here is that you end up printing more money. Printing is the, obviously uh, uh, a shorthand word for saying the creation of more money in reserves, in banks and so on. Uh, you end up printing more money that is not accompanied by enough value creation. And therefore you create the danger of inflation and the failure to achieve the target which uh, modern monetary wants to achieve. On the other hand, we have the cryptocurrencies idea that we don't want to have any state money anymore, any fiat money. Let, uh, let every individuals uh, run their own currencies, digital currencies through a decentralized electronic payment system. So whereas MMT says, says that the state creates and controls money, and this is good uh, for labor and for, for a better society, the cryptocurrency says, uh, supporters say exactly the opposite. We don't want state money. We want this uh, crypto money, this digital money, which is decentralized 
and is not controlled by anybody at all, and the state is not involved. But this really is not any money, because if money is a universal equivalent uh, that everybody recognizes as money and prepared to exchange for whatever goods they've got for money and vice versa, or, and to use money to put in their banks and keep saving and hoarding or whatever, uh, then cryptocurrency doesn't meet that bill. And you can see on the left hand side that uh, the bottom left, that shows a huge volatility which has taken place in the price of cryptocurrencies since they began, particularly in this uh, 21st century in the last 20 years, uh, to apparently replace uh, government money. And actually, because it's measured in dollars, it gives, away the, gives the game away, really, that everybody still looks for dollars or pounds to convert their cryptocurrency, bitcoins or whatever, uh, to something that they can use uh, actually uh, on day to day or in uh, in the, in their livelihoods, rather than just having an asset, because it's basically a speculative asset, like a piece of artwork, or a bond, or a stock. It is not really money at all, and it's also we now know a seriously dangerously speculative uh, sector of uh, financial assets, which has involved a lot of corruption, of fraud, and um, criminality. Apart from the failure to actually provide any alternative to state funds. The other part of the money books chapter is the key question of inflation, which uh, uh, concentrated the minds over the last two or three years, where we've seen a fairly sharp rise in inflation after decades when inflation, at least in the <coughs> advanced capitalist countries, has been as low as um, 2 percent or below each year, uh, a very small increase in inflation. Now we've seen in the last couple of years inflation rates hitting double digits, even in countries like the UK, uh, Spain, or elsewhere. And uh, I just went into this quote here from Jay Powell, head of the US Federal Reserve, uh, who said, uh, after this experience, we understand better now how little we understand about inflation. And I say that because it demonstrates, from my, from my point of view, that mainstream economics has really no idea why we've had this burst of inflation, uh, what the causes of inflation are, and what the consequences are uh, for the economy, and of course, in particular, for working people in that economy. Uh, we've been told recently by the governor of the Bank of England and by others uh, who are important officials that the cause of inflation is because workers have been asking for too much wage rises. This is somewhat difficult to believe, but if you look at the uh, second quote there by Jason Furman, a leading mainstream economist, who says that uh, basically, if uh, wages go up, that leads to an increase in prices. If uh, airline stewards and restaurateurs ask for more money, then airlines and restaurants must raise their prices. And so what causes it? Uh, the increase in prices that we've seen is uh, an increase in wages demanded by attendants or others in the, in the workforce. And he calls this basic micro common sense. Well, uh, it's not common sense and it's also not true. We now clearly know that the inflation burst that happened wasn't started by workers suddenly demanding more wages. It was started by a huge rise in energy and food prices across the world as supply chains broke down uh, after COVID. And as we came out of that, people had money that they've been saving up, but there was no production uh, to meet that. And um, just to throw back very quickly, we deal with that in the book too, that this question of whether wages cause price rises uh, was discussed back in the uh, International Workers, International Working Plans Organization Association in the mid 1860s, where we, uh, Marx was general secretary and the trade council leaders were participating in that. John Weston was the carpenters unionist member on the general council who said, if uh, you, if wage rises, if workers ask for more wages, uh, then the, the bosses will raise prices, uh, and so inflation will rise, and so wages in real terms will fall back to where they were. So it's pointless for workers to ask for more wages. Um, Marx spent some time, and in a pamphlet, Value, Price and Profit, which is still readable, by the way, if you want to do that, to explain why, first of all, wages follow increases in prices, as we've just seen in the recent period, and there are lots of things that affect, affect price rises, production, uh, productivity, 
the value of money that we've just discussed and different phases of the industrial cycle, whether we're in a boom or a slump. All these affect uh, prices much more than any rise in uh, the rate of wages. In fact, the rise in the rate of wages is more likely to affect the profitability of uh, what capitalists are making, not the prices themselves. And in the book, we discuss a alternative understanding of inflation, which we call the value theory of inflation, where we relate the changes in money supply to changes in new value as measured in the hours of labor. I won't go into a detail on this, but we explain that um, if profitability falls under the capitalist economy, which it, we will argue it tends to do so, then that slows the growth of value. And if central banks continue to raise uh, their money supply, that doesn't keep into line with this slowing of the growth of value, then there, there will be a, an increase in inflation rate. The, the graph on the right shows the US inflation rate uh, measured against this value theory we have um, from 1960 to more or less up to now. And you can see there's an inf a, a rising inflation period up until the 1980s and then a falling inflation period up until 2019. We think that in the book, we try to explain that we can match that with a theory based on the value. Chapter three is about value and crises, that the fault lines of capitalist production lies very much in the profitability and investment uh, process and whether the profitability is being made sustained for capitalism. Where it isn't, then it inevitably creates the conditions for regular and recurring crises. Again, I can't go into this in great detail in the time available uh, because I'm using it up fast. But we, we're, the argument under capitalism is that capitalists produce for making more money. That's M to C to M dash. And in, to do that, they must put workers to work to produce more value than they pay them in wages. And that extra value, uh, surplus value, becomes the basis of capitalist profit. But under the Marx's law of the tendency of rate to profit to fall, uh, that process can only be achieved by investing more and more in the means of production, technology, plant, machinery, and so on, relative to the amount they invest in wages. And if labor power is the only force that creates new value, that only labor creates value, machines don't create value. They have value in them and they can produce more products, but they don't create more value because there's the, the amount of labor time in there is fixed. But when workers go to work, they can add more labor time and therefore they create new value. So only labor power creates new value. And so if that's the case, then profitability will tend to fall. If you look at that formula at the bottom there, S over C plus V is Marx's famous formula for the rate of profit. S is the amount of profit. C is the amount invested in machinery, plant, technology, and so on. Uh, constant capital, Mark called it. And V is the amount invested in wages. So you can see that if uh, the amount invested in C rises faster than the amount invested in V, then it will lead to a, uh, and if it's faster than the increase in the rate of exploitation, that is S over V, then the rate of profit will fall. I've had to do that very quickly. So that is why I want to note the little uh, YouTube uh, reference uh, URL I've got at the bottom there. This is really great. This is a nine minute explanation of Marxist law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall by Cliff Bowman of, would you believe it, the Cran Cranfield Institute, uh, a, um, well, a, a, an organization really based on management, it's a management institute. And Cliff Bowman in nine minutes does better than me in explaining this theory exactly and the law of the tendency. So I recommend that if you have a moment just to watch that on YouTube for nine minutes. Uh, but is Marx's law correct? Is the Marx is it true that the law of the tendency rate of profit fall leads to a, a general fall in the rate of profit under capitalism over time? Well, the empirical evidence is strongly in favor of that. And you can see in this graph, it doesn't go in a straight line. There are periods when profitability rises, but on a world scale, which some of us have worked out, we can see that the rate of profit on capital throughout the world, in the major economies at least has been falling over the last 150, 160 years. And that's increasing the intensity of problems for capitalism because it means that crises appear on a regular basis when profitability is insufficient to sustain further investment. And it's only resolved by having slumps, which lead to the uh, removal of old 
capital, machinery, and so on, and companies and their work, and the re raising the unemployment of workers, so in order to reduce costs and restore profitability. So the evidence is strong that Marx's law of the tendency of the road forward to fall uh, functions as the basis. And here's a quick graph to show you. If you look at the crises in the US in the last, uh, since the 1950s, uh, what it shows you is the, just before, a year before we get the recession in 1958, the rate of profit in the US fell by 14%. You can see that on the left-hand side and profit growth fell by over 9%. And that, when those things happen, within a year or so, you get a, a slump and a crisis. So there is a direct relation uh, uh, if lagged between profitability, the amount of profits produced and its uh, growth, and then the recession. Again, you see the 1974 recession that there was before that one year before, a fall in the rate of profit of 12% and a fall in the amount of profits eventually of nearly the same. And if we look at the great recession of 2008, you can see that the fall in profitability a year before, in 2006 actually onwards, uh, was 20% and then a fall in the profits of 12%. So a fall in profits leads to a fall and a slump in investment, leads to a fall in a, so laying off of workers and the loss of weak income for people, and therefore consumption drops away, prices collapse, and we have what is called a classic slump. Once that takes place, it creates the conditions for a new cycle of growth uh, going after that, because profitability is restored by the slump itself. That's the cyclical basis of Marx's law of profitability. Chapter four, I have to move. Modern imperialism, this is important development in the 21st century. It's a systematic uh, ex expropriation and transfer of value from the peripheral countries of the world to a small group of dominant countries, economies. This was an idea presented to us back um, 100 years ago with Lenin and others uh, about the nature of the development of the capitalism through the, as it spread, spread globally, that increasingly it would be the case that a small group of dominant countries would control the value around the world and the peripheral economies, very, they would not join uh, the advanced capitalist world, they would become dependent upon the advanced capitalist world, or at least dominated by them, and unable to move towards the level of technology and living standards that we see in a small number of countries. That argument is still with us 100 years later, with the same group of countries uh, that are dominating the world. They've hardly changed in the, the imperialist club at all uh, since Lenin wrote his book on imperialism in 1915. So no country can escape this domination while imperialism lasts. So uh, in the book, we describe how that domination takes place, how the surplus value flows from dominated countries to imperialist countries. It does it in a number of ways. Now, one of the ways that we concentrate on is what we call unequal exchange. That is that um, although there is an international price on which you have to sell goods on world markets, whatever it is, and if your technology, if your country's technology or company's technology is not as good as the imperialist country's technology, then you will not be able to compete in markets. You'll be forced to, uh, uh, if you go into the market and sell at the international price, what will happen? There'll be a transfer of the value that your workers in wherever it is, Bangladesh and so on, uh, will find it in the course of international composition that a section of that value created in the hands of the Bangladesh capitalists will be transferred through the international markets uh, to the uh, capitalists of the more advanced economies, the imperialist bloc. And these are measures on these graphs of how much that unequal exchange is worth each year. It's, it's You could put it this way. It's worth five to ten times more in transfer of uh, value from the dominated countries to the imperialist bloc than the imperialist bloc hands out in foreign aid every year. The foreign aid is tiny compared to the huge transfers, not only in unequal exchange through trade, as I've just described, but also through the transfer of and repatriation of profits, rent and inter interest through debt and so on, and through uh, also increasingly the extraction of natural resources from those countries. In chapter five, we deal with uh, robots, knowledge and value, another key question in the 21st century, that we now have the produ production of mental labor as being almost, if not more important now, 
than production by manual labor, particularly in the advanced process we see in technology. And this mental labor, production of knowledge, which can be used and appropriated by capital in order to produce uh, software services and other uh, things that we can't uh, see objectively, if you like, but only appear digitally, has been one of the biggest expansions that we've seen and changes in the nature of, of capitalist production. Robots and artificial intelligence are replacing human labor as a result. That we don't, they don't need so much human labor. Will they replace humanity altogether? Is a question posed in the 21st century. Just to briefly say that we now have more, or nearly have more robots than humans in the world. Uh, but you'll be glad to hear that robots' average life span is only about eight years. Humans' lifespan, depending on which country you're in and whether you're poor or rich, is say 60 to 80 years. So even though there's less humans than robots, they don't last so long. They have to be replaced on a regular basis. In increasing, therefore, to go back to Marx's law of profitability, increasing the investment in constant capital as opposed to variable capital, and therefore intensifying the downward pressure on profitability for capital. Um, will AI and chat GPT and those things be a game changer? We discussed that. Uh, <clears throat> It's quite a, a complicated chapter because we look at the question of the nature of knowledge. We look at how it, whether machines really can think like human beings. And we argue that uh, that's not really the case, that uh, human beings can uh, go further than just uh, extension of existing knowledge, which what machines and AI do to, to incorporate and extract all existing knowledge and turn it into something that we could use. That's a powerful thing. But only human beings can really take it beyond that to transform, imagine what could be possible, the potential and qualitative changes, which we don't think machines can do. And that's a big blockage for the ability of the machines to replace humanity over the rest of this century. Finally, uh, got about five minutes. Oh, Michael. just enough. Thank, thank you very much. Thank so you. Seems yeah. to go, uh, so let thank me you. just deal in five minutes then with what we're all aiming for, at least in my view which is to bring about a change from a class, a riddle class society of huge inequalities, poverty for most people, uh, extreme rich for a tiny, for the regular and daily exploitation of humanity by a small number of people controlling the means of production, namely capitalism, production for profit, which we've just described, and all the contradictions that that produces to a society where we could end that, where... Uh, Humanity combines together and cooperates that everything that we have produced, the means of production and our labor time and all the natural natural resources are under common ownership. We don't have private property of the means of production anymore. And on that basis, we produce things in order to meet people's needs directly. Uh, we don't need, uh, we will we'll not have money. We will not be exchanging on the market to make profit, to get more money. Uh, they'll be the end, if you like, of the law of value. How's that possible? Well, let me just remind you that already we have certain parts of the economies of the world which don't operate on the basis of uh, producing for money, although capitalists would often like to turn them into. You think about uh, a health service, education to some extent, even transport and so on. There are various basic social uh, needs which are met by direct production. Uh, that we have uh, ownership, common ownership of those things. They produce things and people get them free at the point of use. How are they paid for? They're paid by the surplus created by all of us. And if you like, in this case, by taxation of some of that uh, surplus or production or, of people's wages and profits in order to pay for those for direct uh, consumption and direct production. So the law of value doesn't apply in those areas. Uh, except insofar as it applies through the government's uh, policies. But we could move to a society where everything is commonly owned, that there is no means of production which is in the hands of some private capitalist, uh, where the class divisions between the owners of the means of production and those who work for them ends, where we no longer need a state machine, national and otherwise, in order to maintain uh, the control of the ruling class and the owners of the means of production against anybody who resists their exploitation and their power, and move to a, a government which is administering this process of uh, production 
and commonly produced to meet social need. That for me is some of the basic points about socialism and that, that what we discuss then is how we go from capitalist production to socialism and what, is, and what attempts have been made to achieve that and whether they've succeeded. And so we outline the first conditions of what that means. We need a democratic government where the working class controls that government and the institutions directly uh, and can remove people in mind. They don't earn more than the average person uh, working in it. And then we have a basis of state control of finance, public ownership, progressive taxation if we need it. And the leveling up of the incomes, and as I say, production of things that we can do at the point of use that are free. And therefore money and markets and prices gradually disappear in this transition towards socialism. That has not been achieved anywhere in the world. And the, the attempts to do that are discussed in the book and, and why they're not succeeding. But it remains the basis of objective in this 21st century uh, to achieve. And... Andreas, I think I finished enough. Thank you very much, Mikey, for the tour de force through the book. Excellent. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Oliver, I think we are going to 